Welcome to Two Truth, where we explore controversial topics in religion, philosophy, and history from at least two different perspectives. Today's topic should be a fun one. We're going to be looking at the true purpose of yoga. That's going to require us to look at two different things, the ancient or classical world versus the contemporary viewpoint on what yoga is all about. So we'll go chronologically and we'll start with the ancient world and perhaps a good place to begin would be this claim that you often hear in yoga studios today that yoga is 5,000 years old. Now there's essentially zero evidence to back up that particular claim. For one thing, there's no written record. Of anything going back that far. When you get back way 2000 plus BCE, you're dealing with what's called the Indus Valley Civilization in India. And we don't even really know how to decipher uh, their form of writing. So we don't really know exactly what they were doing or not doing. Interestingly, from this time period, around 2200, 2300 BCE, in the Indus Valley Civilization, you'll encounter something called the Pashupati Seal, which is basically looks like, I'll bring it up here on the screen, but it, is, it essentially looks like a god in a cross-legged position, somewhat similar to lotus posture that you'll hear about later. But here's the reality it's small. This isn't some massive thing on a wall, you know, like a mural that would obviously be important. So it's totally unclear what it even is. And it's just as likely that it's a representation of a king sitting, right? Or a god sitting, but that doesn't necessarily mean it has anything to do with meditation or yoga or really anything other than possibly political or even business oriented. We don't know, right? Now, it's not that we can't say anything about what may have been going on in the ancient world in terms of yoga. First off, you got to define what we even think yoga is. Discipline of the mind and of the body. That's extremely broad, but that's a good answer that um, sort of will cross all the different time periods. Uh, we'll get into what the specific definition and purpose is for like the classical period here in a few minutes. But just working with this idea of it being, you know, maybe discipline of mind and body, there is something we can turn to from the ancient world, and that would be the Rig Veda, these earliest texts that we do have where they bring up discussions of the gods, creation stories, stuff like this. There's one piece of this text. It's in the Rig Veda 10.136. It's known as the Keshin Hymn. And in it, you'll have this sort of like cryptic statement about like wanderers, basically, who kind of go out and are living like an ascetic lifestyle. They're not really living like everybody else, right? In a, in a city or something like that. And they sort of like go with the winds and they drink from Rudra's cup, which might imply that they're immune to poison, which is sort of a supernatural, super normal power that will be mentioned many, many times in later yoga texts. So maybe it's possible there are people doing like ascetic type practices uh, there's a group called the Vratya Brotherhood. 
and outcast, basically. So if yoga has this deep, deep roots to maybe like 1500 or something like that, BCE, then that's really all you've got in the way of helpful evidence. So where should we start? We should probably start around 500 BCE. There's a group called the Shramanas. They're mean strivers. They are living an ascetic life out in the forest, and they've sort of renounced the typical goals of worldly life. Right? So that's where a lot of the techniques that you'll find in yoga later will develop. Meditation uh, techniques, breath work, uh, seated postures, mantras, things like this. But we're not even going to look at that, okay? We're moving across our timeline. So we actually want to start somewhere around the 3rd to the 4th century CE. So like 1,700 years ago approximately, let's say. And we want to look at something called the Yoga School of Philosophy. It's one of these six darshanas or philosophical schools that were very, very popular back in the day, right? Now, if we look at the yoga school, we'd have to look at their primary text. So there's something called the Yoga Sutras. And the Yoga Sutras is really, it's one text. There are other texts that are important, which we'll get to in a second. But in the Yoga Sutras, in a sutra is like a little thread, a one-liner almost. They're very short statements that are very condensed philosophical wisdom. And then there's a long commentary that's going to draw out what is actually meant by that uh, sometimes quite short statement. Perfect example, Yoga Sutras 1.2, probably the most frequently quoted aspect of the Yoga Sutras. You're gonna get this, um, this phrase, Yogash Chitta Vritti Nirodha, which is stating that the purpose which is what we want here, right? What's the purpose? Purpose of yoga is to essentially still or stop the fluctuations of the various states of mind. That's what the goal is. So it pretty much tells you right out of the gate, we're talking probably about some form of meditation is going to be critical. Much more important than anything to do with the body. All right? The body is not viewed very positively in a lot of ancient philosophies, both East and West, where you'll kind of have a dualistic situation. The body is kind of slow, decays. It's not as pure as consciousness, say. Okay? So this is something that you are dealing with in India, and even in other schools of thought, Buddhism, this is a huge issue, right, of how do we alleviate suffering, it's the first noble truth, or in the Bhagavad Gita, very famous, right, text that will inform later sort of Hinduism, and there in 623, I believe, it says, simply put, that like the purpose of yoga is to separate you from suffering. I mean, that's pretty, sounds Buddhist in that particular way. And the Yoga Sutras aren't going to really disagree with that either. So what I'm getting at here is that in order to understand the classical school of thought for yoga and what its true purpose is, I'm going to make it very simple. The purpose is to achieve separation and isolation of pure witnessing consciousness, which comes with a state of bliss, from impure matter. That's what's really happened. These things have been mixed, okay? They're mixed by something called the gunas, these different forces that are pulling things together and apart in different ways, okay? We don't need to go into all the details of that, all right? However, it's important to know that you're dealing with a dualistic system, okay? Samkhya philosophy is what this is called. The yoga school 
is very similar to Samkhya. One of the key differences between the two is that the yoga school will introduce and accept something called a shvara or a high god or lord. And that's different from the more almost atheistic Samkhya school of thought. But if we look at the, the Samkhya school, they're going to suggest, and it means enumeration is what Samkhya is. Like they're going to talk about 25 levels that make up reality. All right? And most of these levels are material levels. Even your mind, what we think of as like our normal mind and processing, cognizing different things, uh, sensory perception, all this stuff, that still falls under like the material kind of bad in a sense almost, or not bad, but flawed. How's that uh, way? Uh, part of reality. What we want to do is we want to be able to quiet or still the mind, the body, and through immobilization, it's the key word, immobilizing either your body, breath, mind, or later, which we're not going to get into here, but in the medieval ages, it becomes more important, like semen, by immobilizing one or more of these four things, you're going to then be able to amplify energy in another direction, which can force a separation to occur, which is the goal here, We're trying to isolate off Kaivalya. That's going to be the goal of classical yoga. Isolating off from being stuck in kind of like the muck of the rest of material reality this pure eternal light and perfect consciousness that's that has also a bliss element to it that is the goal which might shock you because it seems to be quite at odds with what we'll see is the contemporary uh, goals with most people practicing uh, what would be called yoga today right? so let's uh, look at how we actually achieve this goal I mean, if that's what we're aiming at, right, the separation of this pure aspect of reality from the sort of impure aspect, then what's really the step-by-step -step process to achieve this, right? And the answer there is going to be, according to Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, following the eight limbs or eight auxiliaries. We don't have time to go into about, you know, details on them, but just to list them off and give a little bit. The first two of the eight are ethical instruction. So you have step one, the yamas. Now it would be nice if it was just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, but it's never that simple. You've got level one, all these subcategories, right? Level two, subcategories. So in level one with the yamas, the primary thing is nonviolence. The yamas mean like restraints. They're things that you should not be doing. You should not be violent, right? You should not be stealing. You should be, you know, obviously telling the truth. You should be, you know, celibate. You shouldn't be coveting things. It's stuff like this, right? That's a little bit on the yamas, right? Stuff that you're not supposed to do. Celibacy and nonviolence, I'd say, stand out as very important. Celibacy is important mainly because of immobilization. Again, right? If you're, if you're not engaged in sexual activity all the time, then energy that's otherwise being lost can be repurposed, it's that type of thing. So that's level one, the yamas. Level two, the niyamas. These are ritual purifications and practices that you ought to be doing. Should have a clean body. You should not be overly concerned with like desiring for specific fruits of various actions that you're taking. 
that's going to be something that is borrowed in many ways from karma yoga from the Bhagavad Gita. So you'll see that the Yoga Sutras in truth and the Yoga School philosophy is very much a mashup of pre-existing ideas. Primarily meditation stuff from Buddhism and other philosophical concepts with like the soul, karma, reincarnation, uh, stuff like that from texts like the Bhagavad Gita. Right. So the Niyamas, you've got clean body, you've got not to be attached to the fruits of actions. And then the big one, another big one here is going to be tapas, which means like heat or asceticism. So you're going to have to do certain sacrificial type practices that are going to repurpose energies. Because okay? you got to build heat. Okay? Only through heat do you create steam. Only through more heat do you create, like, even it's like a plasma, right? Or different states of matter. Same thing goes for your soul. Okay? Then there's something called Svadhyaya, and this is to basically read sacred scripture, right? You need to have a background in theory. It's not all just practice. Then last but not least, you have Ishvara uh, Pranadana, which is too long for the Lord. So that's what you've got under Niyamas. Those are the first two steps that are going to get you to your goal of isolating off pure consciousness, which I'm going to introduce two terms now. Pure consciousness is going to be Purusha. Right. You'll see that down on the screen below. Purusha. You want to isolate that from the material aspect of reality, which is Prakriti. That's going to be our goal. So we've looked at two of the eight steps. Now let's look at the third. This one's critical. Asana. It means a seated posture, basically. Um, when we get to modern yoga, it's everything, right? All these different poses. But in the classical world, you know, 1700 years ago, they did not care. There was no such thing as a lot of these standing poses or, you know, handstands and all this stuff. All that matters for step three, according to the Yoga Sutras, is that you can sit in a comfortable, upright position where the spine's not all, you know, twisted. So you can have a straight spine and you can sit comfortably prepared for meditation. That's basically it. So that's step three. Step four is known as pranayama. So this has to do with breath restriction and breathing techniques. It does have to do with certain counts and a lot of, whether it's Buddhism or any form of meditation that really develops, you'll often get something like box breathing. Today, it might be popular as a simple example. You might have a four count in, a four count hold, and a four count exhale or something like that. They have all these different uh, counts where you have a longer inhale, longer hold, stuff like that. But the real purpose of pranayama in the ancient world is actually breath restriction. As in literally like, you know, holding your breath. The Buddha even does this for a, a good while. He practices this. In fact, he claims to be very good at it, that there was no one really better than him at it. And he thinks that it doesn't really work fully, but it does give you an approximation of the goal you're trying to achieve. See, the breath and the mind are linked. Maybe not so much on a Western viewpoint, but in India, this is definitely how it is. From going back to the Upanishads and earlier texts, like towards the Vedas, they have these, this idea that somehow they're linked. So we all know it's hard to meditate, but it's a lot easier to hold your breath. For a long time, not so easy, but... Still, if you hold your breath for a very long time, like as long as you can, you can achieve a state of stilling the mind to some extent and focusing the mind. Eventually, your mind's going to be very focused, isn't it? I can't breathe. I'm going to pass out or something, right? That's 
you're not thinking about dinner or what you're doing tomorrow in a state like that. So pranayama is really about this restricted breathing so that it's helping you to prepare for what the experience of meditation farther down will be like, okay? That takes us to the fifth of the eight steps. The fifth step is known as pratyahara, and it means like to, it's about contraction. So the, the image that's normally used here that's helpful is a turtle, right? That's gonna get sucked back in basically, right, to its shell when there's any sort of danger. And we're all in danger of being constantly mixed into the external world and the illusions that come from, you know, thinking things are permanent and whatnot in the world of becoming. So here we have a transitional step where we're basically gonna be shifting more internally. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean here that you don't that you're just shutting off your eyes or something like that completely, you might still have a meditational object, an image of a god, a candle flame, it could be anything, literally. You know, a water bottle, doesn't much matter. But you're starting to shut down all the other extraneous, superfluous elements of material reality, okay, with step five. Moving on, deeper in. Now we get to the key, really what it's all about here, which is dharana, meditation, fixation. Dharana, dhyana, samadhi. Those are the last three. Dharana, dhyana, samadhi. They're not different things. They're a deepening of the same thing, which is fixed concentration, calm, fixed concentration. Here's how I always explain this, and I think it's helpful. If you think about like a huge funnel, all right, I mean, a really a very large one, and you had a marble, right? And if you try and throw that marble into that large funnel, depending on the angle, right, you threw the marble and how much power you put into it, it very likely just going to go around the edge of the rim and fly right off. That's how meditation is at the beginning. You have about two seconds, three seconds, where you're focused on something and then whoop, gone. You're thinking about, again, food <laughs> or something else, right? So with this first step of meditation, Dharana, you, it's like having droplets. It's intermittent is the right word. You have some focus, you lose it, right? You come back to it, to the meditational object, you lose it. So that's what it's like, right? A bunch of just drops, not a steady stream. The steady stream comes with the next step, dhyana, which is a more immersed form of meditation, right? Now you're able to fixate on one thing only at this stage and you're able to hold it for longer. So the analogy is like um, flowing honey versus drops of water, right? A lot more stable and less intermittent. But you still haven't like shut down uh, memories or imagination and other elements. So let's say you're fixated on an image of a tiger as your meditational object. Well. Okay, if you're at the level of level seven here of our eight steps of dhyana, you might be able to at least focus solely on, you know, solely on tigers conceptually, and you're not thinking about other things, you know, other animals and whatnot. But you still have the mind it is, is still able to move. You're deeper in the funnel, right? Can't move as far and it can't fly out as easily, right? But it's not perfect fixation yet of things. You're still activating thoughts and memories and things relating to the concept, say, of a tiger. As we get further down now to the final step of Samadhi, now you really have a calm, total 
absorbed form of concentration. It's just you and then that one meditational object. Not thinking about all tigers or whatever. It's like you and that that one object or image if you're using something like that. Um, as opposed to a form of meditation where you have your eyes closed and you're focused on God or Ishvara or something like this. So Samadhi is what will bring us to the goal because we have forced our energy and concentration into such a, a narrow place and immobilized everything else that you now have the energy to create, to, to do the work that's needed, right? You need steam, right, for steam engines and things like this. So you you have the the power to force that separation eventually. But Samadhi also has anywhere from four to seven levels, I suppose, depending how you want to slice it up in the text of the Yoga Sutra. So it gets into even deeper and deeper states where there's you and there's your meditational object. Eventually, the meditational object, you're seeing it in its uh, atomic structure where it's, it's basically kind of starting to slip away as is the distinction between subject and object. And that will, with, with more time and focused concentration, slip away as well. And then eventually you will achieve, if you're lucky enough, a what's called as Nirbija Samadhi, which is without any seeds. There's no, there's no seeds of samskaras or memories or latent impressions that are being activated anymore and you have effectively isolated yourself your, your atman it's it's separated off your soul from the rest of material reality and it comes with tremendous bliss now you know why do you not i've got something here right why would you not i realize this is not uh not yoda but close enough like in the movies yoda dies disappears right just fades away why do all these yogis not just disappear and fade away into their robes or whatever when they achieve this state they come back and one possible answer there is that good analogy if you think about a very large water hose or a ceiling fan even if you turn off the hose right which is what has been done here we stopped the whole process. It's shut off. There is still water in the hose. So you have still activated certain certain karma before you even got into the deep meditation. And that has to effectively play out. Um, just like the water from the hose still has to run out. Or the ceiling fan shut off still spins for a while. Right? It has this residual motion and power to it. So there you have it. That's your, your take on classical yoga. All right. And what the goal is isolation, separation of Purusha from Prakriti and how you achieve it through meditation, but through an eight fold path, almost like, right. A Buddhist sounding thing. You have this eight step, uh, process in the yoga sutras to achieve it. So, Let's stop there and then take a look at what the other side, 20th, 21st centuries, right? What are they saying about what yoga's true purpose is? So the contemporary form of yoga, whether <laughs> it doesn't matter really what yoga studio you go to, it's pretty likely at least that you will encounter a whole plethora of sequentially linked poses with maybe like a dash of breath work, pranayama, right? And possibly like a hint of mantra, which we haven't talked about yet, which can be like mind or sonic tools, like Om and saying that over and over. 
And maybe even you'll have an optional uh, guided meditation or relaxing component. These are the sort of things that you're going to find in the various types of yoga classes that are offered in the, over the last 40 years, let's say, uh, in the Western world. Okay? Now, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just very, very distinct from what we saw with the classical world. So in the modern world, the goals of yoga are, I think it's safe to say, flexibility, strength, relaxation, and community. Community being a big one, because this is in many ways almost like a, a, a new religion, a new substitute for you know, people that may have come out of a different, not so great religious experience in their childhood or something like that. So yoga provides one or more of those four things to people in the modern world. Flexibility, strength, relaxation, community, right? Those four things. Now, how's it going to get there? <laughs> we'll like, what, how does it achieve these goals? Right? We'll, we'll get to that, of course. But just like last time, I want to give a little bit of the history and background, the more recent history, going back about 130 years only, and seeing how all of this occurred, because it's quite different right, than what we were talking about before. Two places to look to. The late 1800s, a bunch of ideas from India and people from India, you know, spiritual figures, are moving to Europe and the United States. Or they're giving talks. Swami Vivekananda, a big one. He's giving very important talks in the early 1890s where he's talking to, you know, Harvard World Parliament of Religions, like major groups that it just blows up the whole message of what, at least he's claiming, uh, Hinduism and yoga is all about. So in the late 1800s, you're going to get what could be classified as modern meditational yoga, where you still are retaining this focus on meditation and devotion possibly as well to a god as being important. So that does make its way into the Western world. However, yoga today seems to be it's something quite separated off from that. Because in the early 20th century, very early, you're going to have the rise of a couple important figures. We don't need to go into many of them, just the key players here. Krishnamacharya is the main guy. This is someone who just managed to kind of by chance, one step after another, uh, bring in the key elements of what will become more contemporary yoga. So he was a scholar. He claimed that he went to Tibet and learned all these different poses uh, from a guru there and that the guru told him he needed to come back and teach this style of yoga to the, to the world, and he does, and he achieves it. Question is, how much of that story is totally accurate, and how much of it is sort of made up? Uh, it does seem that he got a lot of his information from what could be called today like exercise science, physical culture, as it might have been known then, like gym type culture, that was becoming wildly popular, like the YMCA, stuff like this, uh, exercise institutes in India. And in fact, we know he did go to one. He was told to go, and it's right after he goes to this one institute, which is like an early institute of like exercise science, that he brings back this sort of style where you're you've got all these different poses and you're holding them, and it's seems like, you know, more strength and flexibility focused um, at that point. So Krishnamacharya is going to teach this system that he creates with these different poses. And now we have standing poses. Now we have uh, inversions and stuff coming about. Remember, in the ancient world, 
there's only seated postures. It's not until the 10th century, like only maybe the last thousand years, that we have any evidence of texts of non-seated asana postures, okay? So he's bringing in what looks like essentially like a calisthenics type routine. And the British, of course, right, have been there and it's a mix is what I'm getting at. Modern yoga today is in many ways you could say it's almost as much Western ideas of the time of the early 20th century as it is ideas directly borrowed from India. It's quite a blend of the two, right? Another huge shift that will occur in the modern form of yoga, the role of women. Women are the majority of yoga instructors today. They're also the majority of practitioners if you go to a studio. You go back 2,000 years ago, there's going to be effectively zero. It's, it's a male-only, male-dominated situation. Right? We with totally different objectives, as we've seen. So Genevieve Stebbins, I think Annie Call, these two create something called harmonial gymnastics that is big on the strength and flexibility side, again, of what will then become yoga, okay, as time goes on. And there are other individuals who, females, who bring in what we might call new age ideas like chakras and things like this. And I'll get into that a little more here in a minute. Right? Here's a key term that you need to be familiar with. MPY stands for modern postural yoga. That is the terminology that you'll hear in the academic world today to describe what most people are doing. I mean, look at the key word is the middle one there, postural. You're doing poses. More specifically, you're doing lots of poses for a short period of time linked in a sequence, a flow, a vinyasa flow. You're placing one thing on something else in a different pattern and moving, shifting, 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 right? from warrior one to warrior two to this, right? Reverse warrior, all these different things. And you're moving every five seconds, maybe 10 seconds. That is different. In the, the older texts and things, the idea is you hold one pose for a long time. Even Krishnamacharya, this guy who's kicking us off with more modern yoga, he's still holding poses for a long, long, long time. Not moving quickly from one to the other. That's going to be something that is a, a contemporary uh, change. That and, so that's called vinyasa krama. This idea of the fact that you're like linking them in a, a sequence, right? All these poses. Then there's something called a counter pose. Often you'll get in a lot of the different uh, sequences that you'll have today this idea of like counterposing one stretch with going another the other direction or something that never existed that's a completely modern add-on to all of this so anyhow mpy modern postural yoga the primary people for modern postural yoga are krishnamacharya his student and related through a marriage to his daughter, I believe, uh, B.K.S. Iyengar, very important figure in contemporary yoga, and then uh, K. Patabi Joyce for Ashtanga yoga. Those are the three. Those those three people pretty much push what we're more familiar with today especially Krishnamacharya's followers, Iyengar and Patabi Joyce. They come up with these like sequences that, um, that you should do over and over, basically. Even things like sun salutations, you'll hear this a lot, 
It's a very repetitive structure of, of certain poses that you'll do as a warm up. Never existed, really. It's, it's a modern invention. In fact, many of the ancient texts warn against doing the same like repetitive patterns over and over again. So pretty much everything that we do today is different than what they did in the past, is what I'm getting at. Even when you're doing pranayama, which was in the Yoga Sutras, today when you're doing pranayama, the focus is going to be on normally something called ujjayi breathing, which is a victorious form of breath where you're, you're building a, you know, heat with a closed mouth. You're building heat for going through this one hour uh, sequence. You're not holding your breath. Can you imagine trying to go through, <laughs> you know, another pose, another pose, D arm balance, an inversion, you're sweating, you're not holding your breath or something, you would pass out. It's just, it's, again, totally different. Objectives and structure, okay? Mantra could be a similarity. Uh, chanting of Om, that is ancient. That is something that's always been around, and that is something that you will sometimes see or hear in a, a yoga studio today. But if you do, it's normally, hey, let's go and take uh, three grounding breaths and then do three ohms or something like this. It's not a chanting normally of, of a single mantra for you know, an hour. That's not what's happening. So... Uh, again, not quite the same. Right? Here's something that did exist in the medieval period, but is popular today and is sort of a gateway to our last thing I want to talk about, which is the New Age movement. Kundalini, this idea that there is like a coiled serpent of energy and a female principle that rises up, you know, rises up in front of the spine along a subtle energy channel, a central channel. And in the process is like going through different chakras of which there might be anywhere from four to seven of these wheels. So chakras like wheel or energy vortex leading all the way up to the crown of the head. Um, this is something that is a blend of techniques maybe coming from some medieval uh, text and tantric texts too in India, but gets woven into the total just like almost grab bag of stuff that you get in today's yoga studios. And the popularity of stuff like Kundalini could be related to the fact that the New Age movement has pretty much always been linked in to contemporary yoga. The New Age movement is like an eclectic set of beliefs, practices, ritual objects. For example, crystals. Crystals are everywhere, right? Quartz versus smoky quartz, right? Uh, you know... Maybe you need that. Maybe you need uh, citrine. Maybe you need something else, right? They all are supposed to do something to your, you know, alter your emotion, right? Or even physical health. Right? So that's a very new age idea. The use of crystals, they're extremely popular right? in today's yoga studios. Other things that you'll deal with are the chakras that I mentioned. So explaining all seven of them, maybe working with them during a sequence or having workshops, which are really popular in contemporary yoga on like weekends to have workshops where you might do a sound bath, another new age kind of newer practice that's popular. Uh, Reiki, which is an energy form of healing where you're laying on of, ha on of hands kind of. Astrology, extremely popular. A lot of people are into astrology that that are also practitioners of yoga. Now, again, not everyone, not even the majority. It's just extremely eclectic. 
in terms of what you might get. Often people that consider themselves spiritual but not religious, that kind of falls under people that might be interested in yoga, people that might be interested in uh, new age ideas as well. Self-help, all that kind of gets thrown under this umbrella here. So there you have it, all right? You can see that these are very different goals. In the classical world, who cares about the body that much? I mean, it's, it's a vehicle that we might be stuck in, so to speak, but it's also a mess of disease and sores and decay, as the Buddhists would have it, um, right? It's not important. What's important is some form of liberation or awakening. Right? Modern world, what's important? Well, <laughs> we want our body to look great. We want it to feel great. And there's nothing wrong with that because, you know, you should stretch, right? You should have more flexibility. You should have more strength. You should seek more relaxation and you should seek community. All those things are helpful with the stressors of our contemporary life. Yoga evolves. It always has from all these different time periods, right? From like ancient, pre-classical, classical, medieval, colonial period to modern forms of yoga. There's pretty big differences. There might be some common threads, right? Between all of them, but there's more differences often, I'd say, than there are similarities to it. So that's the, you know, that's two different takes that you have there on it. My personal take as someone who has practiced uh, various types of yoga, current forms of yoga, I think that it is something that you should bring into your life. It's something that will, if nothing else, allow you to achieve the goals that are listed in the modern form, right? The flexibility, the strength, the relaxation, community. So if that calls to you and you're missing those things in your life, then it's a great way to bring that uh, material in. However, I'd have to caution and say that, you know, theory should always be mixed with practice. All too often, I say in the yoga world today, it's practice, practice about body-based things, and there's very little background on the deep philosophical roots of yoga that are critical if you really want to make big gains and achieve higher forms of liberation. So with that, you've seen both sides and I'll end as I always do by telling you, you should probably stay gray between the black and the white of these two different viewpoints, right? See you soon.